<laughs> Jeff fucking Thorpe. Dean Del Rey. What's happening, babe? Dude, I think I've known you for 50 years. Nah, not for 45 years. 45 at, years. At least, man. I'm 58. I, I and I think I started seeing you. You started in like... I, I don't know, VR started in 79 or whatever, but around 80, I think, is when I started seeing you. Man, uh, it, it's hard to believe when I think back in those early days. Uh, we had such a great, we were part of such a great scene in the beginning, and uh, it just turned into something the whole world looked to, and uh, it's just amazing, man. It's great to see you again, my friend. God, I haven't seen you in easily like 30 years, I think. Yeah, I, I it's it's incredible that's that it's gone been that long. Like it's amazing to see you, man. I've been following your career as well and uh really impressed, man. Some really funny stuff and uh glad to see you keeping the the, the rock and roll going on this, man. You're doing it all, brother. Oh, uh, thank you, man. Where where are you? Where do you live now? Um, I spent about half the year in Northern California in Martinez. And I also, I'm in Germany about half the year. So I do a lot of, a lot of business in Europe. I mean, you, you know, it's funny that the first record is called soldiers of the night because you are, I mean, this is the God's honest truth. You are a true soldier of metal, man. You, um, the dude from Anvil, and and Lizzie Borden, these guys that just keep going forever, and you know, and not not on the giant level, but have been. Uh, I don't know if you have a day job or whatever, but you've been playing metal your entire life. It's it's incredible, man. Uh, you know, I a lot of, of course, you know, it's just uh, a passion uh, that I still enjoy. But, you know, being part of this thing that happened in the Bay Area in, in uh, you know, the early 80s uh, has just kind of perpetuated us uh, to, to just keep the ball rolling. You know, and I, I'm still uh, I'm just thankful, man, because I still enjoy it. Um, we just finished like 50 shows uh, this year already. We did uh, 40 shows with Raven and Wicked and Lutharo uh, around the U.S. and uh, just got back from Europe uh, a few weeks ago. And so we played the Sweden Rock Festival over there, ran into Paul Horwith, uh, Paul Taylor. Wow. Uh, and uh, it was incredible to see him. I hadn't seen him in years either, man. And uh, so we've just been very, you know, we, we've worked very hard, but we've also been very lucky, very fortunate. And it, uh, this is the 45th year of Vicious Rumors, man, 79 to 2004. Man, I have so many VR memories. Some of the earliest ones would be Cal Skate in <laughs> Runner Park. Chuck Moomy on guitar. Yeah. Uh, Cal Skate, buddy. I'm at the skating rink. They had like, I think it was like three metal bands played, and you guys were one of them. I don't know if you remember or not, but we built this big ramp thing. We we built this big stage thing for that because we knew it was a, a real big place. And we just had the opportunity and the supplies. We built this kind of like Klingon looking ship thing with ramps and stuff all over the place. I don't know if you remember any of that, but, uh, <laughs> you know, those are some great times, man. And uh, Santa Rosa was an incredible place to be at that time. There was so many great bands and local clubs and in the area. And so I'm, I'm just thankful to be part of it, man. It's really crazy, man. I mean, like I, I one of my early uh, auditions as a singer was uh scanner, you know? Okay. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, I remember like, we would go to these keg parties. It'd be like Vicious Rumors, Scanner. What's his name? Jim Cassera? Yeah, Jim Cassero. Yeah. And, he was the and, and then Hazel. And, uh, yeah. you know, this is, uh, you know, like really early on, all these bands would play these keg parties. And one time you guys played a keg party 
and you didn't have a singer. So this chick got up there and sang Green Man Alishi. It was crazy. She nailed it. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's so cool, man. You know, it's funny that I remember back in the, in those times, uh, there was this place called the Fulton Grange. Oh yeah, the Fulton yeah. Grange. The Fulton Grange, and and a couple of guys, uh, a couple of guys lived there, and um, at the time, and they were just these low key dudes, and uh, they if if we went in there and gave them like seventy five bucks and some beer and stuff, they'd let us throw this insane party. Yeah, and we'd have a couple of bands and some kegs and doing everything illegally and under the table and uh, you know just having some wild times back then, man. But uh, it was a lot of fun, man. Now you guys, I was trying to remember. Did you play the? Um, I know Scanner did. Did you play the um, Motley gig at the Santa Rosa Santa Rosa Civic Halloween? No, that wasn't Scanner. That was us. That, oh, that was, was you. Uh, Got you. That yeah, that was Vicious Rumors, Page yeah. One, and yeah, Motley it. Crew. I still got the ticket. It's an orange stub. Oh and, yeah, yeah. It's on the thirtieth. It's not actually Halloween. It's on the thirtieth. Oh okay. And I have the ticket stuff. I think it says five dollars. You know. And oh I yeah. Also, I also sat on the side of the stage and took photos that I showed Nikki Six when he did the podcast. He was blown away, man. Oh, but that Jim is Cacero so was in the band, because I got a photo of him. Right? Was he in your band or? I think he, he was just. I think he was just there. Oh okay, he was there. Oh, no, Wait a minute. I'm trying to remember. I remember he had. Remember those. He might have been, he might have been there. Remember he those, might have been in the band. Remember those Gibson Explorer twos E two. Yeah, sure. That's what he was playing. <laughs> like a red one, right? Like a red. I think it was a red one. You know, it's funny because. Um, Dude, so long ago. Uh, Nick, Nikki Six just recently, uh, or a couple of months ago posted the flyer from that show right and, and it was like oh this was the good old days you know with a little caption underneath it and uh that you know i i remember i had a really funny tommy lee experience that day um he he came out of their dressing room and and i don't know if you remember or not but that was when they really were kind of darker you know they oh, kind of yeah, like, laid his boots on fire and they were like evil remember yeah they had that, those trees on stage with the skulls for flowers and stuff you know like they were super dark and heavy then and um <laughs> and he came out of his dressing room and he had this like crazy outfit on man and i was just like looking at him and he was kind of you know warming up and kind of shaking his body getting ready and and uh, and I'm just like looking at him. I was like, oh, I'm like, hey man, that looks fucking badass. And it was so funny. He just stopped like a little kid. He just stopped like a little kid and just was like, really, man. And I'm like, I'm like, hell yeah, man. I was kidding. You look fucking awesome, man. And he just like jumped up and did a little kick and stuff. And I'm like, holy man, this guy's out of control. But that was a lot of fun. God, oh, that that's like an iconic uh, tour for them, you know uh the the first record and you know i remember cat cat was working at that tower records or um uh what was that record store called not tower uh the other oh. uh, under the freeway what was that place? yes yeah uh, record factory record factory record, okay yeah 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 and i went in there and she she was playing the record and i was like who's that and i bought it and then they came to santa rosa like a couple weeks later you know yeah <laughs> did Good you times, see, yeah. did you see except and um and saxon at the santa rosa uh vets i absolutely did yes oh that was you know, that, that that show was so special to me back then because I had just recently uh, discovered Accept before that. Right. And um, and it's, you know, you know, it's funny, like, Dean, you remember like when you when you kind of found a band before your friends did yeah. and then they were like, then they were like your band, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I, I was like telling all my friends, oh, you've got to go to this show like Saxon and Accept, you know, I was just uh it was, it was pretty underground back then you know not not a lot of people were fully in tune with those kind of bands but that was a great show oh yeah it was crusader record for uh saxon and it was balls to oh, the yeah. wall for except 
uh, right when it just came out. And, you know, it you can't it, go wrong with that game over. Okay. Exactly. Let's get into it a little bit. Cause I've known you a hundred years. You lived in Hawaii, you moved to the Bay area uh, and you start vicious rumors. And, you know, early, early on, I remember seeing you guys all over, you're going through lineups and stuff. And eventually you get the lineup of, um, Gary St. Pierre, Vinnie Moore, and 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 that lineup does a record for Shrapnel. So was this a, now that it's so long ago, was this like a platform for um, Varney to show off Vinnie Moore? Because he would have these bands and like, you know, Ingve and stuff like that and place them in, in bands. Was that what that was? Because he left right after, right? I Yeah, I believe uh, that there's definitely an element of that, you know. Um, I think we're, you know, Vicious Rumors is probably Shrapnel's like longest running act that's, you know, from yeah. from back then till now. Uh, we never really took a break or anything. But yeah, Vinny, uh, at the time, we uh, we didn't have a second guitarist. And uh, Mike was giving us these cassette tapes of uh, Vinny Moore and Kirk James and... God, there was one other guy, like three um, absolutely amazing guitar players. Um, God, I can't remember the third guy. Okay. But anyway, we, uh, you know, the one from Vinny really, you know, took us by storm the most, even though all three of them were fantastic. And uh, yeah, Vinny came out and um, he had just recorded that Pepsi commercial. Um, he did like a little guitar shredding thing on a Pepsi commercial in LA and then came up and we made, you know, he came up, stayed at my house and uh, we, we worked on the record together, went in and recorded it. And we played one backyard party <laughs> in, in, in Santa Rosa. Um, we played one backyard party brother. And, uh, and that was it. That was the only thing we did live with Vinnie Moore. Wow. And then, yeah. And I think that um, Vinny was always uh, more focused on like being a solo artist. And of course, he eventually became the longtime guitarist for UFO. Of course, right. the, uh, the longest running guitar player they ever had, actually. Yeah. Um, he was in there longer than anyone. But um, yeah, I mean, it was amazing to play with him. And, uh, you know, we were, we were all, you know, just crazy fucking kids ready to rock and um but that album has a you know a fire and uh and uh and something about it that you know i'm just honored that people still love it today you know well um, man we it, it had some it had some kind of metal uh quote unquote hits you know soldiers of the night great of course but march or die and blitz the world those were like big live tunes for you guys, you know? Thank you. Yeah. I'm, uh, you know, Vicious Rumors, that's one thing that we've kind of always tried to retain is that, you know, putting the song first and trying trying to come up with, uh, you know, we, we love metal and we love uh, the action and, and the intensity of it and all that. And we, we wanted to put, you know, some strong songs together and, always kind of keep the song the the most important thing and um so i'm super honored just that any songs that i wrote you know 35 40 years ago and people are still singing them today you know it's funny the the tour we just did um was the soldiers of the night tour I, unbelievable like you know we did that one party with Vinny, and then yeah. he left and so then uh the band sort of reformed and we moved into the digital dictator era. Right. So we never, we never toured on soldiers of the night. And if, if you would have told me back in 1985, Oh yeah. Uh, well, we'll just do the soldiers of the night tour in 2024. You know, <laughs> I, I would have I thought you were crazy, but uh, it was incredible, man. We, we, we played uh, most of the songs off that album and then a handful of hits around, around the world just now. And uh, it just it was a lot of fun to just play those old songs and uh, see people enjoy it. And so it was really awesome. Was that recorded at Prairie Center Chorus, right? It was uh, Soldiers of the Night and Digital Dictator. 
at Prairie Sun with a hundred hours to get it all done. Yeah. Mooka, come on, baby. Bubba, I need you out of there, Bubba. Hey, come Bubba. on, Bubba. Hey, Bubba. And uh you're great. Was like Steve Fontana working on that? That's right, man. The classic shrapnel guy. And he was, you know, you've worked with Steve. He's yeah. he's a, a real pleasure to work with. Like he's such a like a upbeat guy. He's kind of funny and he's got like his own charisma. And just I don't know. He made you feel like you were doing something special. Oh yeah, man. You know, uh that guy later on went on to do that giant uh Santana record uh with Smooth and all that, you know, like that Yeah, big, good for him. Yeah, big one like 20 years ago. You know, he was he was uh speaking of soldiers, man. There's no brutaler job than just doing all these metal records for Varney. <laughs> And usually at like two, three in the morning, uh, let's get another lead take on that, you know, and you're just fucking upside down because it's a machine in there. It was like a, a Motown metal machine, you know? Yeah. God, that's so wild. I heard that Prairie Sun closed recently. You know, I did not know that. I, yeah. I, I imagine uh must be a very tough business, though, having a recording studio with everybody's home studios now. Right. And what I mean, legendary records out of there. You guys, Exodus, Bonded by Blood, all the shrapnel stuff. Uh, you know, it's it's yeah. unreal the the walls in there could talk. You know, oh, absolutely. Ingve recording there. Yeah, Ingve, and you stay in those little chicken shacks, you know, that were made into an <laughs> yeah. apartment. You know, when we first got there to do the digital dictator album, uh Carl Albert, the uh saint albert man um uh, he uh it was funny he's like jeff what are you doing to me man this look at this place i'm like i got allergies and like i actually didn't even think about that like i kind of forgot that he had these allergies and we show up and it's like you know f surrounded by five miles in every direction of <laughs> you know open fields and stuff but yeah we had a great time at prairie sun and oh, um the best yeah, that was just a cool, you know, it was like you were going to like a comp, you know, a commune or something, you know, like those big gates in the front, you know, yeah, pulling in. open up, you pull up the hill and then yeah. you know, they had Studio A and Studio B and then and Buka would be in his office. Hey, Bubba, I got to get the <laughs> money, Bubba. You, you still owe money. You know, <laughs> I gave you a spec deal, but you still owe me 500 bucks for the tape. <laughs> oh, man, I loved him. What a. I mean, that shit is wild. When you think about that <laughs> studio and then that area of like Katati Cabaret, the Phoenix Theater, the River Theater, and then oh, all, yeah, all the party places uh, where people would have parties and just show full concerts, like 20 keg party with metal bands. Right, right. It was, it was a beautiful time, man. It was really, really a beautiful time and uh, really, really, uh, when I think back, I just feel like, you know, we were, we were, everyone that was there, I think was luckier than they know to be part of that, you know? Oh God. Yeah. Right. I mean, just think about like, sometimes people ask me like what it's like, and I don't even bother telling them the stories because it'll just seem like bullshit. It's like, this guy's full of shit. You know, it's like, you can't, <laughs> you even, can't make that up, man. You can't make that up. But also they can't even imagine the magnitude of every night metal was going down somewhere. It was wild. That is so true. I mean, uh, you know, when I, when I first, Dean, when I first started Vicious Rumors, I just made a thousand business cards. And, and this is when I first got there. And, I didn't even have a band together yet. I just had the name. I had Vicious Rumors with this like flying V crossbone thing. And um, I just went to, I, I could literally go to rock shows like five nights a week easily. Yeah. Yep. Um, just to all these different venues. And there was an audience to support it all. And, uh, you know, I just went out and passed out cards and, you know, Six months later, people are like, oh, there's that guy from Vicious Rumors, you know, but I didn't even have a band yet. But yeah. it was uh, it was just that that thriving of a scene, as you remember, with so many, so many venues, so many places to play and just a, an incredible live music atmosphere in North Beach and, and around the Bay Area. 
Yeah, it's you think about like bands like Y and T and and Eric Martin and and Huey Lewis. These guys made a living touring Northern California. You know the tubes. <laughs> they, they, I mean, every week it's like, well, we're in Napa, and then we're in yeah. Fremont, then we're in Berkeley, then we're in uh, Guerneville, and, and then we're in Fresno. It was wild. Yeah, that's true, man. That's true. So, and then uh, and then the radio, like KOME, you couldn't get away with that shit. Dennis Erectus was doing back then. Oh yeah, yeah. God, I haven't thought about that guy in so long. That's amazing. You brought him up. And how about uh, rest in peace, Billy Steele? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. A true champion of uh, promoting local metal bands and and stuff. And he he did a lot for Vicious Rumors uh, over the years and. We miss him for sure. You know, I was thinking about it last night as I was thinking about uh, interviewing you. And, you know, when you're young, you feel bulletproof. You know, you can do drugs, you can drink, you can you can get crazy. You don't need any sleep, whatever you're doing. But, you know, early when we're young in our lives, we lost Carl and Cliff Burton. And it was really wild to think about how young these guys were and they were just gone one day. I mean, like gone. And you're like, yeah. what? And it, it, I think that everybody handled it like they didn't want to dig into their emotions and they just kept going like, God, fuck, you know? And then like, years later, you think about it, you go, that's fucking insane. Like our friends were gone. You know? Yeah. That's nuts, man. You know, I guess, uh, I guess that's just kind of a tough part of life, you know, like the longer you survive, the, uh, the more brothers you see fallen. And, um, yeah, losing Carl, uh, to us was just like beyond devastating because, uh, not only was his voice, I mean, he was just literally like, you know, and, and I, I'm, I don't just say it because I'm, the leader of vicious rumors, but I really feel like people around the world looked at Carl as like one of the best metal singers ever. Uh, he just had this incredible range and charisma. And then on top of that, he was such a good friend and such a close friend. So it's like, talk about losing like, you know, one of your best friends ever and the identity of your band as, as the voice. So yeah, it was a real, uh, and I, it's funny the way you just kind of described it. Uh, that's it. We were polarized, man, but we felt like uh, there was nothing left for us to do, but carry on, you know? Um, and it's funny because Carl and I had even had conversations of like one of us passed and like, you know, you know, we got to be sure to just keep rocking. And, you know, I don't know, man, it's just, yeah, life is so fragile and can be so short, you know, oh but, my uh, God. yeah, for sure. Especially back then it was really wild. Cause you know, you had to be home to get the news. There was no cell phones or emails or anything. So you had to be home and somebody called you and go, fuck, Carl died last night. And you're like, what? You know, and it's just like a brutal blow. It's because it, we were so young, you know? Sure, sure, man. I appreciate you uh, bringing him up and remembering him so fondly, brother. Thank you. Oh, man, I would hang out with him all the time. Omni and the Stone, you know? I think he lived at like Debbie Abono's house or something. Yeah, did, uh, did he live there or something? Because uh, no. I, would, I, would, I would see him all the time. Yeah, yeah, he worked at the Omni like part time when That's he wasn't right. on tour and stuff. Yeah, so he w worked at the Omni and he lived uh, in uh, the God. Where did he live? Out uh, out in the East Bay yeah. for a little while back towards the end there. But um, yeah, he was. You know, you could just never like, even if he like did something. Like I remember one show, like he showed up. Like we, he was late for a gig and we were like, we had to play like contractually. So like, we're like, all right, well, we'll just start. And then hopefully he's going to make it. And I remember we just started abandoned was the, the first song and it just like, doo, 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 doo. and all of a sudden we just see Carl running in, man. <laughs> he comes <laughs> running in and got right to the microphone, like right at the first, you know, word of the show. Wow. And then like, you know, 
he's just the kind of guy like you couldn't be mad at him. You just couldn't stay mad at him. Is he just too funny and just oh yeah, it's a real a real character, man. A real a, a real amazing one of a kind person. And Let you know ask, his son. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you ever met his son, Dean. Did you no. ever meet Kevin? Kevin? No, I, didn't, I didn't know he had a son. <clears throat> he has an uh, incredible, talented young son. Uh, not so young anymore. He's in his thirties, but uh, you know, uh, he's a chip off the block, bro. He's a chip off the old block. Same kind of facial expressions. Very similar sense of humor. Um, incredible voice. Wow. I mean. Uh, yeah. Uh, and we actually got close to him after we lost Carl's. We didn't, we didn't meet him before that, unfortunately, but, uh, he's definitely part of the family now. And, um, uh, you know, we, we stay in touch, uh, throughout everything. And yeah, amazing to whenever like Larry and I are around Kevin, you know, and he'll be joking and make these faces and make some kind of and we'll just like be going, oh my God, there he is, you know. Larry, another fucking soldier in metal. I've known Absolutely. This, I've known this guy almost as long as I've known you. He is always on the drums in, in VR. It's crazy, man. I love it. Yeah, Larry and I are the original members still going strong. And uh yeah, Larry's uh just you know a force of nature and just uh i love jamming with him you know it's like it's like fucking playing with thunder and uh so he's we we still love the action we're still going strong and uh we got some some really great guys with us and um yeah An another know? another guy that uh that is a soldier i don't know if you talk to him still or whatever you know how bands are but ira black that guy he's he's like whenever a band needs a guy they get him he's got the crazy long hair he comes in <laughs> just peels off solos <clears throat> oh I mean, yeah crazy it's impressive how uh yeah ira uh absolutely man he is uh he's also just a force of nature the way uh, he gets around and is a super great networker and great musician. Uh, I can see why people want him. You know, he just, he's got a great look and he's a, an amazing player. And so, yeah, Ira's, I, Ira might take the cake for like a, all of the most named bands like he's been in, you know? Oh, totally. But, like uh, one, one day I'm just looking, he's in the Bullet Boys. You know? Yeah, yeah. Thing, you know, he's, he's playing with Lizzie Borden or something. He's like, oh, this guy's all over the place. He, Definitely. He's in uh, the Dio Disciples right now. Oh, that's right. I just saw that. And they're going to they're going to get ready to go play the Alcatraz Festival. And uh, yeah, we, we uh, last summer, we we headlined the uh, Headbangers Open Air Festival in Germany. And it was just incredible. We, we did something we'd never done before where we played uh, the Soldiers of the Night album and the Digital Dictator album in full. Wow. For that for that one special show, and um, Ira and his son, young Ira, he has a son that's a chip off the old block. Also, the long hair guitar player looks just like him. It's so amazing, man. And uh, they they came to the gig, and uh, we we finished the set with a, a version of "Don't Wait for Me," and we had Ira and his son come up and uh it was funny because uh i invited you know i said hey man if you know the song you can come up and jam it with us too as i invited his son to do it and he just was like his eyes got really big and he just went back and he, he was on the headphones man he's just learning don't wait for me right before we go on and wow. uh and we did the song and uh and a couple of parts that he wasn't familiar with instead of like you know playing it wrong or something he just you know rolled the guitar volume up fist in the air and uh real professional and uh he really blew me away too but yeah ira and his young son and ira uh you know, kind of did the grand finale with us and yeah you know we got a big family in vr yeah old school man let's talk a little bit about once carl's in the band you guys do digital dictator and then you get the atlantic records deal which is a big deal back then because that's a major label. 
and uh, boom, you're uh, you're on Atlantic. Who signed you? Was it like Kevin Williamson or something? No, uh, Jason Flom. Oh, Jason Flom. Oh, my God. I had him on the show. I know him well. That's wild. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. about that. How did it happen? Does he come see you at a gig or? Yeah, what we were, uh, we had met a guy, uh, the, the guy that was the link to Atlantic for us was Bob Zemsky. And uh, he had come and seen Vicious Rumors at the Omni uh, at one of our shows and really loved the band and was like, uh, oh, I got to see these guys again to see if it was just a one night deal or, you know, and then he, he sort of followed us and started watching us. And um, man, uh, he just really fell for the group and uh, felt like he was going to be able to get us signed. And uh, so we did like a little series of showcases and uh, like, I think, I think we did uh, two showcases and the last one was, uh, was opening for Paul Stanley at the Omni on oh, Paul Stanley's solo game. tour. Remember that? Oh, he played "I Still Love You." It was fire. Oh yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a real, uh, real treat to to be on a show with kind of like uh, someone I've admired so much over the years. Oh yeah, and uh, and he was really awesome. Like him and his crew, like they gave us like they uh, we had you know told them that we're showcasing for Atlantic. You know that night, this is our final kind of showcase. And they gave us that, you know, plenty of long sound check and all the lights we needed. And it was really, really cool of them to, to kind of help us, you know, instead of hold us back. And uh, yeah, so we uh, we did this amazing gig with with uh, Paul, Paul Stanley and the Omni. And that was the night that Atlantic said yes. And um, we and used to practice. Was there? No, um, he wasn't there. Uh, we were working with uh, Peggy Sullivan, who was an A and R person that, uh, under him, and a guy named Nick Ferrara, who's now like a uh, legal, a uh, legal uh, attorney and law offices, like music law and stuff. I think he handles Pantera and a bunch of bands. Like he's doing pretty good in New York. Uh, another guy won't return my calls, but no, that's oh. I took him to Japan. What the hell? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So that led to the signing, and I don't know if you, I don't know if you remember downtown Oakland back then, but oh yeah, right down right down the street from our studio was the Mexicali Rose yeah. uh, restaurant, and we used to go there a lot and just hang out, like afterwards, have have a beer or whatever some food and uh we ended up uh, signing the uh, atlantic contract down there and it was kind of felt it felt it was an exciting really rewarding time you know so after the gig uh, you go there and he whips out the papers <laughs> uh no we had already uh i don't believe we did it wasn't right after the gig it was like you know like the next week or something right, like right, that right yeah. but they had said you know okay we're gonna do it at the wow. paul Stanley show wow and so yeah Super exciting. I mean, you know, we and, and the thing was, we had an offer from Roadrunner at the oh, time, yeah. too. And we were very we were just about to go with Roadrunner because we felt like, well, we already had two albums from them. Our European thing is kind of taken off and like maybe that's going to be the better way to go. But then when the Atlantic thing happened and they said, yes, we just were like, God, Led Zeppelin, ACDC, uh, I, you know. We gotta go. We gotta go with Atlantic, man. Of course. So, um, and and those that signing that deal uh, definitely paved the way for uh, Vicious Rumors to be around forty five years later. You know, in what way do you think? Because it became worldwide, and uh, the records were everywhere, and videos, and it was more pro. Well, I think just because. Uh, it got it, it it really uh cemented us as a touring band so we started touring all over the place and we we got uh quite a good reaction for as a live band and so the you know there's a lot of uh you know uh, attachment of course to being on a major label so yeah it just it's i think just it was the professional the league all of a sudden you know 
yeah we were all of a sudden we were up on a, you know getting better shows and bigger tours and doing doing some getting some better slots and things like that and you guys did and dynamo then, after that right yeah yeah we did dynamo give me and, that lineup uh, it was like death angel who else was on that that's right man it was uh Oh, oh man. Okay. It was Mordred. Yeah. Testament. I, I don't know. I don't think Testament was on that one. Right. I think this one, I think this one was death angel. Um, sacred Reich. Wow. Trouble. Oh yeah. Mordred. Yeah. Vicious Mordred. rumors. And that's crazy, right? Yeah. Just there 40, might, there might... people. Yeah, there might have been one other one, uh, one other band on that one, and then one of the first bigs we uh, first big festivals we did was with uh, Megadeth, Testament, Flotsam and Jetsam, Nuclear Assault, Sanctuary, and Vicious Rumors. Like that's just such an awesome lineup, you know? Oh my god, yeah. But that it's, that was a big one. It's amazing how. I don't know what kind of money you make now or any kind of money or whatever. Nobody really makes money except for touring and merch, but there's bands like that status quo where they've been together like 50 years and they still sell out all over Europe, like Europe and, and Brazil and these places, they don't give up on bands. They just, that's their band. That's true, man. I've always loved that about touring in Europe. Um, People are a lot more open minded to different uh, types of bills. Also, a lot of lot lot of bills that you'll see over there you wouldn't really see here, uh, just because I think people are I don't know maybe just more open minded about different styles on a festival or or on a tour. But um, you know we've uh, we've been uh, in the underground the whole time. There's no doubt about that. But we've had. Uh, steady climbs uh of course i've had uh downtime replacing a few musicians here and there or whenever i was in between record deals but for the most part vicious rumors has never broken up since 1979 we've just been plowing forward and um yeah i mean this last tour we did really well on uh we saw our fan base kind of growing and the attendance going up in the U S and uh, our headlining shows in Europe were really well attended. So, you know, it's a great feeling, man. Um, well, there's you a know, huge it, rebound on metal, you know, but, and that's, that's really a big part of it. You know, like now is a great time for bands like vicious rumors too, like Anvil Raven, vicious rumors, Death these Angel, bands, Exodus, these bands that had, you know, might not have made money back in the day now can go out and make a living, you know, and uh, yeah. they don't have the labels and everything. They just go and do their own thing and, and get the money and, uh, and, and tour. And that's what we do. Also, our tours are self-sufficient. We, we pay for everything and pay the band out of the tour. And, and um, doesn't really, the record company just helps a little with some promotion, but they're not really involved in the, in, in that aspect of it but yeah i mean the thrash metal bands i think are uh like like you were mentioning testament exodus death angel uh you know those those bands have been doing really well really well the thrash metal scene is as popular as ever i think and then you know with us being a more of a little bit more of a traditional heavy metal band like um raven anvil and those bands that i mentioned also uh also just a great time for our style of music also i think there's a lot of people that are kind of realizing like wow when these bands are gone then that whole that whole thing is gone you yeah. know yeah. um so uh and it's and it's incredible to see people show up at the shows with like a picture of me and them from 25 years ago and then they brought their you know younger son or you know their nephew or something that they brought someone with them who's discovering this kind of older heavy metal music and stuff but i think it just goes to 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 the fact back to what i was talking about earlier about just like if you if you have a, a if you have some songs that can stand the test of time then you can work a long time, you know? 
Oh yeah, yeah. Without the songs, you ain't you you're not gonna be doing shit. You know. How many records did you do with Atlantic, and then <clears throat> eventually do you get dropped when the whole kind of scene starts to change? Exactly. Uh, we did three albums for Atlantic. We did the uh, the Vicious Rivers self self titled album in 1990, and uh, Welcome to the Ball album in 91 and then we did a live album live in japan on in 92 and um and, and in fact last year in 2023 the three atlantic albums were released in a box set wow and um, and it's funny because the ever since the pandemic uh of course when all music live music was shut down uh, we we were really kind of struggling to get things back on track. Um, everybody was so nervous to book everything. And you know how it was, man. Like, I'm sure you probably yeah. experienced the same thing in the comedy circuit. Uh, it was crazy. Done. Yeah, you know? just people were afraid to book. People were afraid to take chances. So it was looking really bad. And then all of a sudden, 2023 and 2024 turned out to be these incredible touring years for us. And part of that was this company in England put out a box set of those Atlantic albums. And uh, and then this last year, a German company re-released Soldiers of the Night. And so um, when I see, you know, these companies do that, they what they do is they just get the rights to the music from the other previous album, like from Atlantic Records. Or they got Barney. the right to Either from Varney, uh, well, well, Mike Varney actually sold his catalog to the Orchard. Oh wow! So now I deal with the Orchard for Soldiers of the Night and Digital Dictator, but um, the Atlantic stuff, you know, like it pretty much, if you work out a deal with them, you can get the rights to our mute to release one of our albums, and there's not really anything that we have to say about it. We just get this really trickled down royalty thing that could really sucks so what i've done what i did uh, my way of thinking was okay well let's how can i get vicious rivers involved in this okay you're going to release an album i'm going to build a tour around it so yeah. we we booked like 50 or 60 shows around this box set release and so at least i was able to order some of the box sets at wholesale and resell them and uh you know yeah and then and then we book a whole tour out of it the atlantic years tour that's and so cool. that, that's how i was able to kind of get something out of it and um uh, that ended up being a phenomenal tour for us and then uh this year soldiers of the night was re-released so i'm like okay let's do a soldiers of the night tour and so you know yeah um it, it's uh and and now it's time i gotta make a new album because <laughs> yeah, we've, yeah, yeah. we've been doing a lot of reunions and a lot of uh you know a lot of uh you know anniversary tours and things like that but uh it's been a lot of fun man when you first started out um and we were all getting into metal what was it? Was it Priest? And uh, was that really the first one that, and Maiden that grabbed you? How did you start getting into metal? I, I started getting into, uh, well, even before metal, like I started getting into like just rock music from yeah. my, older, my older sisters, like in the 70s. You know, I had two older sisters and they were listening to Led Zeppelin and Jethro Tull and Deep Purple and you know, and all this great music, man, that was happening then. And, and I remember just being very young and noticing like when they came home with their friends and they put on this music and just the way they were like reacting to this music and man, I just looking at them and like, I didn't know even what I felt. I just knew like, man, I'd sure love to be able to do that. You know, just look at, look at this reaction from this music. And so from there, uh, when it started getting, I, I started getting darker and you hit the nail on the head for me, black Sabbath was the first one. Like 
I just thought that was so heavy and so dark and just like, like, oh man, this is really where it's at. And so I was really loving that. And then from that, the Judas Priest uh, experience with the two guitars. Yes. Like just, oh my God, it's even fucking heavier with two guitars, you know? Yeah. So that, that really sold me. And um, which made me, you know, kind of want to be in a, a two guitar band. What you know, and I've always had I've always had kind of a bluesier style, kind of a you know an, an old old school heavy metal style, and uh, so I've always tried to mix myself with someone who's more of like the modern kind of shredder, like. And I was uh, just fortunate enough to work with incredible guitarists like Mark McGee and, uh, of course, Vinnie Moore, and Steve Smythe, and guys like that we were at the ground zero of metallica and exodus what were your original thoughts when you first saw the bands or heard them because it was so much more extreme than say you know here we are we're listening to priest unleashed in the east we're listening to screaming for vengeance we're listening to balls to the wall Saxon denim and leather, and then this comes, and it's absolutely extreme. You know, it was right. like, whoa! I mean, the first time you hear it, it's not like, all right, you're like, what the fuck? You know, this is crazy. Yeah, exactly. I think I felt the same way. Just like, uh, like, whoa, what is this, man? Like, um, I liked, I always liked it, but um. I was always uh I was always sort of drawn to like the bigger show. Like um when I saw that trend coming, and of course back then it was like uh it was like the anti show thing, yeah. you know. Remember like when those guys first came out, it was like the this little production, you don't want to have any cool clothes, you want to just like it's just jeans, t shirts, thrashing, sweating. And I, and I, you know, and that's cool and everything, but honestly, like I was always into like this bigger thing, you know, like this larger than life thing. Uh, I was always a huge Kiss fan and Queen and uh, all these, all these bands that had these incredible like personas and stuff like that. So um, I've always liked it. And of course there were so many good musicians, especially right here in the Bay Area. Uh, as uh, part of those bands but um you know that's one of the reasons i and then of course you know we were we were right in the thick of it you and i with with all that stuff and uh so we had you know different influences from you know from aerosmith to death metal you know what i mean so uh and then that sort of somehow worked its way into uh what vicious rumors created which was in my eyes um traditional heavy metal but mixed with just elements of thrash and hard rock as i think our ver i think the variety of vicious rumors music is a little wider than the than the thrash audience and uh, in hindsight, you know, if we would have gone all thrash all the time, we might be a little more successful because those bands are doing so well today. Yeah. But you know, you gotta you gotta follow the music you love, man. You gotta you gotta be stay true to your heart because if you don't, the audience is fucking smarter than you ever think they are, man. They can see right through you, and if you're faking it or if you're you know if you're not doing something that's real for you, then you know, they see right through it. And that's one of the reasons I think that Vicious Rumors has been successful over the years is because when people see us and they come to our shows and they see us, you know, giving our all at whether there's 200 or 20,000, you know, it doesn't matter. We're playing hard every night. We've got, we got, we're, we run on passion. It, well, you know, it's interesting because when that first stuff first hit, you know, I was at the stone and, uh, I would say it only took me about three months. And then I was like, oh, yeah. And, and, and it had to do with like, you know, the Kill 'em All record was interesting to me. But man, when that ride, the lightning came out and when Bonded by Blood came out and when that Slayer, um, you know, um, South of Heaven 
I was just kind of like, wow, I was in. I was all in. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm full blown Judas Priest screaming for vengeance, going to see them at the Cow Palace. And to me, it was all, it was either metal or thrash metal. It wasn't like I only go thrash metal now, you know? It was, and then yeah. DC, of course, and Van Halen, you know, and, and Dead Kennedys across the street at the Mab. It's just like whatever was radical and outside the box you know and priest was radical man if you listen to scream of revenge it's the actual song and it's on the radio you're going like what the fuck this is on the radio i know right you know you know like unleashed in the east uh the, the live priest album <clears throat> that's still one of my favorite all-time like maybe all-time albums i mean it's even and and just that i just remember that cover man just oh. like you see those guys like KK Priest with it, you know. Yeah. KK's got the flying V up in the air and just, just the center, you know. Oh yeah, all the marshals and smoke, and it was just like, yeah, <laughs> such that, a badass album. That's Kirk Hammett's fucking fuel right there. He calls it the <laughs> greatest metal record of all time, a greatest metal band, which I totally agree with. You know, uh, in that era when you put that shit on, you hear the center, and oh. And, and their version of Diamonds and Rust and and fucking oh, yeah. Green Man Alishi and all that. It's like, what the fuck? Especially compared to the studio records. You know, the studio records like, yeah, in false surprise. But then the live one is just a punch in the face. Oh, it's so true, man. I think that album really, uh, I mean, that was a special album for them too. I think that, I think, I think that all the metal heads that, Got when that came out and stuff, like had that reaction that you had, like, oh my yes. god, they were they were great before, but what is this? You know, oh my god, unbelievable. I had Rob on, and I never knew this, but you know, they recorded that in Japan, and he was jet lagged, so his vocals were awful. So the uh, the next day, they ran the tapes, um, uh, like I don't know, like a week later or something over at Ringo Starr's house or somebody like that. And he sang the whole thing live. He just, Whoa, said, cool. just said, run it and I'll sing it live all the way through. So I'll be winded in spots and it'll be real. And yeah. uh, I, I fucking never knew that, man. And it is just no, me neither, man. so incredible to hear that, right? <laughs> that, that must be a lot of fun for you, like to, you know, because I, I think that you and I have... Uh, have this in common that of course you know we're we're musicians and we're artists but we're also pretty big fans of all this you know so it must it must have been uh when i look at some of the artists you've you've interviewed man i think oh man dean is just having some incredible conversations with these guys oh it's you know, it, and, you know even with you though dude because i i really think about the early days of Bay area. And I was out every night of my life, you know, work construction during the day. And then I'd sure. rehearse in my band and then I would go to the stone or the Omni or the Katati cabaret or the river theater, or the, the Petaluma vets or the, uh, you know, the Phoenix theater or, or, you know, Nile station, or if I, I mean, I can name them all every Nile night station. Nile yes. station, buddy. And, um, and then uh, eventually the Omni and I'm working there and I'm booking these bands and I'm deep in it as a young kid, uh, you know, but VR was really uh, an entryway, you know, it was VR, it was Roadrunner and it was Le Mans. These were the fucking bands to me that were like, I was a kid starting my band and you guys were like, bro, like, whoa, man, these guys are playing with like Motley Crue, you know, you're just, and, and it was wild, man. The shows would be sold out. You know, I remember Roadrunner sold out the stone a Friday and a Saturday. That was fucking unheard of on an unsigned yeah. band. Sure. Sure. That's what kind of, you know, that's just, it's the scene was so strong oh, at God, that yeah. time. You know, and I remember like, uh, I, I remember just thinking like, well, it must be like this, like everywhere. I mean, I, I, yeah. I didn't even think like what we had was that special at the time. I was thinking like, oh, this, you know, this must be in every major city across, you know, across the country and maybe the world, you know, and then, you know, but really like, I really didn't, 
I think none of the artists back then realized that the whole world was going to look to the Bay Area for what was going on there and sort of follow it and 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 ended up being the Bay Area was this sort of uh, you know beacon of you know throughout time. I guess in the '60s you had the beatnik generation, in the '70s you've had you know, the, the hippie rock and, you know, yeah. and then in the eighties you had this heavy metal explosion that was just as big and powerful. So uh, at the same time you got heavy metal though, you have Jefferson uh, starship, you have Huey Lewis, you have the tubes, you have night Ranger, you have journey. journey. I mean, yeah. these bands are, are, you know, and I think about Night Ranger playing Guitar Wars at the Phoenix Theater with Varney's band Cinema. And, yeah. you know, they're just a fucking scraggly, you know, club band trying to make it. And and yeah. just fucking nuts. All these bands are still out playing. You know, Brad Gillis is a good friend of mine. And um, it, I was honored to have him do some guest spots on a couple of our records. And uh, I've always, always just been a big fan and happy to say i'm a friend now too and uh yeah but night ranger uh and they're still one thing i always loved about them is like they kind of had this like you know pop rock sound but delivered it with this like full on like hard you know a full on metal show kind of presentation like uh and they're they're still like that they're just a great band live and uh Brad, yeah, was, just, Brad was insane, dude. I mean, yeah. when I saw that guy when I was a kid and he had that fender with the fucking early Floyd Rose without the fine tuners and he's yep. just, you know, up there doing the early version of that, you know, the flutter yeah. off the bar. And yeah. I mean, nobody was doing that shit when he was doing it. And you're just going like, this guy's insane. And yeah, they would have like, you know, they're poppy songs, but then they would have that song like Night Ranger and you want to play rough tonight. All that stuff off the first album. You're like, these guys are rock. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Like I uh, when he was doing like all that kind of stuff, like especially like that whammy bar stuff. And like I it, it still amazes me how he was able to keep his guitar in tune yeah. without the without the locking. Uh, yeah. Tremolo, and he told me um at one point that he uses this stuff and it's got a funny name it's called big ben's nut sauce and uh <laughs> and he, put, he puts a little nut sauce on the nut yeah and, so it doesn't hang up yeah and it's nice and lubricated and uh but still there's something about his you know um if if you met Eddie Van Halen and you went into his studio and you got to play his guitar and his amps and his pedals and, uh, and everything that was his, I hate to tell you, you're not going to sound like Eddie Van Halen no. because it's in your hands, yeah. you know, and, and you might have some really great tone that day, but <laughs> yeah. you know, these guitar, these guitar players have these, tones and techniques and it really just comes from your hands and uh so he must just have an incredible way of like using the bar and then like bringing it back into shape i don't even know how he does it if i don't have my floyd rose i'm not using the tremolo myself right. <laughs> I, I, I need that i need that lock and nut man what 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 was what you used to when i used to see as a kid you were playing a gibson v right yeah, yeah, yeah. God, I I love that guitar. Um, I ended up breaking the headstock off it like five times, man. Oh. And by the like the fifth time I broke it off, it was just like I took it to the guy that had been repairing it, and when he gave it back to me, it had this huge like chunk of wood on the back, like just to try to try to keep it from not breaking. But uh, yeah, I was lucky enough uh, after after that time. And then when the band got signed to Atlantic, I switched to Jackson guitars. Awesome. And and I had a a, a nice relationship with them for a while. And then uh, in 2006, I've switched over to Dean guitars. Hell and are. now, 
uh, and that is the the that's been the pinnacle for me. I mean, I love these Dean guitars. Uh, they're so much fun to play, and the company itself has just been so fantastic. Um, I'll tell you, I uh, I always play them. I love the way they sound, and it, it's just. It, you know, my Razorbacks and my Vengeance V and stuff. They're just like, it's like playing a bolt of lightning or something, man. I just, you know, those guitars are made for heavy metal. And I love that. Those and, 70s uh, yeah, they, Deans are God, man. The 70s yeah. ones. Come on, man. Like, you know, that guy, uh, Elliot Easton in the cars played that weird Les Paul one with the you're kind of uh, oh, yeah. with the Explorer the, part. Yeah, yeah. The Cadillac. Yeah, the Cadillac, dude. Yeah. And then, you know. Yeah. Billy from Flame had the Dean V and 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 those things, man, they were built so fucking good, man. I mean, oh yeah. Oh my God. They're still good. They they just sent me a Vengeance V with this like satin finish on the back of the neck. And it kind of feels like uh it's a finished neck, but with this like satin uh patch running down the back of the neck it feels like an unfinished it's got this really smooth unfinished neck feel and uh just like when you strum a chord on it uh without it even being plugged in you can just hear the resonance like rang and just like the way the chords ringing out i just so they're 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 still making great stuff and um uh, just Man, you got to have the right tools for the trade, man. And Dean, Dean guitars are just amazing. Now, here's something interesting that you probably you definitely don't remember, but I do. Uh, at the time you got carpal tunnel syndrome, my mom had just got it. And uh, so I had talked to you extensively about it because she got it from like computers back then or or typing or whatever. And she had to wear these kind of wristbands and then she got surgery so after carl passes i believe is that when you get the carpal tunnel yes um let me see yes it was after that so yeah, you couldn't play that. i remember you couldn't play yeah no i was down for a little while man uh it was crazy like i just i it was really weird like i just started noticing like like I would be like, we say you and I'd be having a conversation and like, we're having a cup of coffee or something. And then like the coffee cup would just fall out of my hand and I'd be like, Whoa, what the fuck? Wow. Uh, yeah. So it was like a lot of weird stuff like that. Um, when I, sometimes when I touched, like I just put my hands on a table or something and then I would just get, you know, like electric shock through my fingers and, it was a strange situation. I think for me, it was a combination of just overdoing it, not not taking the best care of myself at that time. Uh, hard, hard to say, but um, I was lucky and uh, I only had to take like, I don't know, less than a year off. Surgery? And, uh, I did. I had surgery in both hands. What they and, do? Uh, they repaired tenants or something? You know, what they do is like, if you ever see someone having surgery and it's down here somewhere, then that doctor did not know what the hell they were doing because the carpal tunnel thing is right here in the palm of your hand. Wow. So, so I had, uh, what they do is they go in about right here, make a little incision right there and they just release, they cut one of the reinforcement bands in your hand and it just kind of opens up, uh, more flow and um blood flow and everything else and um you had to be freaking it, out because what if oh, it didn't was, work <laughs> oh i was i was totally freaking out man and what what got me to go and do the surgery was they were just saying well like you know if because i was thinking about like not doing the surgery and just trying to work my way through it and they were just saying, like, you know, if you there's a chance that if you don't do something about it, that you reach a point where it's just you can't fix it. Oh, and at the time I was, you know, I was only in my 30s then. So I was like, you know, I still got some rocking to do. Yeah. <laughs> How old are you now? I'm 62, Dean. Wow. I'm 58. 62, <laughs> man. Do I'll be get... 63 in November. Do you get social security? 
<laughs> uh, no, I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. You know, like I, I, don't, I don't. I don't know. Can you can you collect or isn't it sixty two? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to collect on something. I'll tell you that much. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I started the band when I was 17 and uh, I never looked back. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, you, you can always like look at your career at certain points and kind of think like, oh, maybe if I would have done this then or done this that way, things could have been different or you know, we got signed to Atlantic in 89, uh, right? And then so when the album came out, it was kind of like that changing of the guard to Nirvana right. and Alice yeah. in Chains and all that. You know, that was kind of already in full swing. Like, like you know, sometimes I think, man, if we could have got signed to Atlantic in like 86, then, you know, we might have really been able to, to, to plant the foundation. But you know what, man? These things happen for a reason. I'm just kind of a, a, I'm a, I'm a believer that I'm really one of the luckiest people in the world because I've been able to follow my dream all these years, and um, you know, no real regrets, man. Just yeah, um, we're alive, dude. We're alive, I'm just, and, and we're I'm on just stage. Thankful. You know? Absolutely, man. I'm thankful. And I think it's incredible that what that you were able to do this, not only in music, but also in comedy. And uh, my hat's off to you, brother. I, you know, you're doing it. You're out there killing it, man. Oh, man, it's been a it's been a wild ride, though, you know, and I'm like, you. I, you know, I always gamble on myself. You know, I, I take the gamble and uh, the other option is uh, not an option. <laughs> exactly exactly you can't win if you don't play now yeah 100 percent, man that's and and you know the funniest thing is i played music for 25 years and and then i tapped out and started working at arlie davidson and then i felt like uh pacino and godfather the three i'm out and they pull me back in you know like somehow i'm doing movies and then next thing you know I'm doing comedy and it's been 15 years now, almost 15 years of comedy. So I've been on stage 40 years. So I'm like you, we've been, absolutely, we've been under the hot lights our whole life. It's a magical place, strange and wonderful. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's funny, like, uh, a lot, a lot of people really just have no idea what, it, what it takes to go and do these things. Like, uh, the amount of hours behind the scenes, the uh, the other 23 hours of the day on tour. I mean, just it's brutal. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it's, you know, and, and a lot of musicians and artists sometimes think they want it. And then when they get a taste of it, they realize like, oh, this isn't for me. But uh, it's definitely for me, dude. I don't get homesick. I get tour sick. Right. I got a, uh, one question before we get out of here. And once again, All right, man. super great to see you. Uh, unbelievable. Here, unbelievable. And once again, I, I do uh, definitely credit Vicious Rumors for being one of my teachers of, uh, you know, gigging in the oh, early man. days of learning that shit. But um, favorite venue to play in the Bay Area back in the day? Oh, back in the day, God. I I mean I gotta go with. It's really hard between the Stone and the Omni, man, because yeah. that's we just had so many great times at both places. But you know what? I'm gonna go with the legendary Stone in San Francisco, man, and that we just had so many incredible times there, and. Um, playing support slots, headlining gigs. But, yeah. you know, it was, it was just a great time. And uh, so I'm going to go with the stone. And uh, later in life, I don't know, uh, we, did you ever perform at this uh, House of Rock in Santa Rosa? No, but I know about it. I definitely know about it. Yeah, that, uh, that guy opened it up, the rich guy. He made this incredible venue. Uh, we were, uh, we got to do like three shows there before it, 
it, it closed, but um, boy, that was a beautiful venue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always looked at Vicious Rumors as an omni band. You know, you guys really, you know, of course, Carl worked there, and uh, and you guys. I feel. I, I'm sorry. You're no, you're right. I I feel bad not saying the omni too yeah. because <laughs> really it's the Stone and the Omni because we we were an Omni band. Carl worked there. Yeah. That was where we did so many shows, and uh, the Omni was an incredible place. We had a lot of fun there, right, Dean? Oh fuck yeah, man! And you know they're trying to open it back up, Jimmy. That's what I heard. I, yeah. I hope he does, man. Yeah, get old VR in there, man. Another Omni gig. You got to come back then, all right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And if you're in L.A., hit me up, man. I definitely will, brother. And come see some comedy. You watch comedy? I, I do. I love it. I, I've watched some of your stuff. Oh, that's and great. I, yeah, and I'll, I'm definitely down to come to one of your shows, man. Sounds good, You got to let me know when you're back in the Bay, too. I'm hope I'm hoping to do the Cow Palace. We've been working on it for like a year or so. That, just to go in there and do that, fucker. Oh, my God. That'd be amazing, bro. Did you ever play the Cow Palace? I never did, no. Fuck. I did Oakland Arena, but I never played the Cow Palace. Yeah, that's that's exciting. Got to get Especially in there, Especially in the hometown. Oh, my God, right? <laughs> All right, buddy. Great to see you. Uh, tell everybody where to find you. Well, uh, you can find us at uh, Facebook, Vicious Rumors. Uh, that's a pretty active thing. It's attached to the Instagram. Um, we're SPV recording artists uh, out of Germany. And uh, wherever uh, free-spirited heavy metal roams, Vicious Rumors will be there. Oh, man. Great to see you. Keep the candles lit, buddy. Great to see you, Dean. Thanks so much for having me on the show, brother. And best of health and keep going strong, man. Oh, I hear you, man. It was an honor to have you, buddy. Thanks so much. I'll see you. All right. Bye. Later, bud. Bye, man. Later.